بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد عليه أفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم. Then as the brothers know, inshallah today's talk is going to be on the topic uh, the seven conditions of the shahada. And uh, in starting, inshallah, and in starting, uh, just to mention a few virtues on the topic. It's a couple of ayat of the Quran. Allah says in the Quran, Shahid Allahu annahu la ilaha illahu wal malaikatu wa ulul ilmi qa'iman bil qist la ilaha illahu hu al azizul hakim. Allah says that he bears witness, as do the angels, as do the people of knowledge, to the fact that nothing deserves to be worshipped except for him. And that he maintains his creation with justice. La ilaha illahu, nothing deserves to be worshipped except for him. And he is the almighty, the all-wise. Another verse which, which uh, explains to us the benefits of the topic and the virtues of a tawheed, Allah says in Surah Luqman, the 20th verse, وَأَسْبَغَ عَلَيْكُمْ نِعَمَهُ وَظَاهِرَةً وَبَاطِنًا And Allah has completed and perfected his favors upon you, both hidden and apparent. Uh, Mujahid, who was a scholar of tafsir from the Salaf, he said about this verse, this is talking about La ilaha illallah. And a hadith which is in the Sahihain, hadith of Itban, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said, Inna Allah harrama ala nari man qala la ilaha illallah yabtaghi bithalika wajhallah. That this companion said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that he said that Allah has made the hellfire haram upon the one that says la ilaha illallah sincerely from his heart. <clears throat> and another hadith which explains to us the virtues of this topic that which Imam Muslim reports, the hadith of Uthman ibn Affan, where he says that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, man mata wa huwa ya'lamu annahu la ilaha illallah dakhala al jannah. Whosoever dies and he knows and nothing deserves to be worshipped except for Allah shall enter paradise. And just one statement from the uh, Imma of the Salaf, <coughs> Sufyan ibn Uyayna, who died in the year 198 after the hijrah of the Prophet wasallam. He said the biggest blessing Allah has ever given to a slave is that he has taught him the true meaning of la ilaha illallah. So as we know, every act of worship has conditions that, and this act of worship is not accepted until these conditions are fulfilled. An example of this would be the salah. If somebody prays without having the wudu, then this salah is not accepted from him. And the shahada of la ilaha illallah is no different. It has conditions which are, uh, which are supposed to be fulfilled and met. Just to show the importance that the salah paid the importance that the Salaf paid to this topic of the condition of the Shahada, Imam Hassan al-Basri, who died in the year 110, after the Hijrah of the Prophet wasallam, he was asked that the people are saying, whoever says La ilaha illallah enters paradise. Whoever says La ilaha illallah should enter paradise. And he responded saying, whoever says La ilaha illallah and, he fulfill, and fulfills his conditions, then he is the one that enters paradise. Similar is the statement of Wahhab ibn Munabbih, rahimahullah ta'ala, who died in the year 110 after the hijrah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was asked, uh, is, is it not the case that la ilaha illallah is the key to al-jannah? So he said in response, la ilaha illallah is in fact the key to al-jannah, but you have to have the correct key to these teeth to open up the gate of al-jannah. And these teeth that he's referring to here are, of course, the conditions of la ilaha illallah. And the scholars are in agreement <coughs> to the seven conditions of la ilaha illallah. And that's what this small brief reminder is going to be at, inshallah. So the first condition is knowledge. That you have al-ilm, you have knowledge regarding what la ilaha illallah affirms and that which it negates. And of course, knowledge negates ignorance. So Allah says in the Quran, فَأَلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَاسْتَغْفِرْ لِذَنْبِكَ And know that nothing deserves to be worshipped except for Allah alone 
I seek forgiveness for your sin. So as we know, La ilaha illallah, then this contains negation and affirmation. It contains two things. It contains a general negation and a specific affirmation. A general negation meaning that when we say La ilaha, we are negating all types of worship for other than Allah. And when we say Illallah, then we are affirming worship for Allah and for Allah alone. Another proof of this is the hadith which we mention, or the hadith of Uthman ibn Affan, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, where he says, Man mata wa huwa ya'lamu annahu la ilaha illallah dakhil al-jannah. That whoever dies and he knew that nothing deserves to be worshipped except for Allah should enter paradise. So here he made knowledge, the Prophet ﷺ, here he made knowledge a condition for the la ilaha illallah. The second condition is certainty, al yaqeen And this negates shak, this, this negates having doubt to la ilaha illallah. Allah says in the Quran, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ ثُمَّ لَمْ يَرْتَابُوا Allah says that the believers are only those people who believe in Allah and his messenger and then they do not doubt that they have no doubt so here a condition for belief is having no doubt another proof of this is that which my Muslim reports the hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu where he said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said مَنْ قَالَ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَى اللَّهِ مُسْتَيْكِنًا بِهَا قَلْبُهُ بَشِّرْهُ فَبَشِّرْهُ بِالْجَنَّةِ Whoever says La ilaha illallah with certainty from his heart then give him glad tidings of Al-Jannah. Another proof of this is that which my Muslim reports again of the hadith of Abu Huraira رضي الله تعالى عنه where he said the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأني رسول الله لا يلقى الله لا يلقى الله بها عبد غير شاك فيه ما إلا دخل الجنة. This hadith the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم he said that whoever meets Allah with these two testimonies of faith that nothing deserves to be worshipped truly except for Allah and that Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم is his messenger that have any without having any doubt shall enter paradise. The third condition from the seven is sincerity, al-ikhlas. Allah says in the Quran, "Ala lillahi dinu al-khalis," and surely to Allah belongs the 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 true religion. And He says in the Quran, "Wa ma umiru illa liyabudu Allah mukhlisina lahu din." And Allah says, "And they were not ordered except to worship Allah alone sincerely." And the hadith which Imam Bukhari reports, the hadith of Abu Huraira, where he said that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said. From the happiest people with my intercession on the Day of Judgment is one who says La ilaha illallah sincerely from his heart. So he made sincerity a condition for his shafa'a on the Day of Judgment. The fourth condition is a sidq, uh, truthfulness, and this negates lying. Allah says in the Quran. Alif la mim a hasiba nasu en yutraku en yakulu amenna wa hum la yuftanun wala kad fatanan ladina min kablihim falaya alaman Allah hul ladina sadaku wala ya alaman al kadibin. Allah says, Does mankind think that they will be left alone by simply saying la ilaha illallah and they will not be tested but rather be tested those before them so Allah can distinguish those people who are truthful from the liars. The second proof of this is the hadith of Mu'ad ibn Jabal, which is in Bukhari and Muslim, where he said, مَا مِنْ أَحَدٍ يَشْهَدُ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَأَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا أَبْدُهُ وَرَسُولُهُ صِدْقًا مِنْ قَلْبِهِ إِلَّا حَرَّمَهُ إِلَّا حَرَّمَهُ اللَّهُ عَلَى النَّارِ This hadith with the Prophet ﷺ said that there is nobody that bears witness that nothing deserves to be worshipped except for Allah alone that Muhammad is his slave and his messenger truthfully from his heart except that Allah makes a hellfire forbidden for him and the hadith of another proof of this is the hadith of Abu Musa al-Ash'ari radiallahu ta'ala anhu where he said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said abshiru wa bashiru nasa man qala la ilaha illallah sadiqan biha dakhal al-jannah that the Prophet ﷺ said 
have glad tidings and pass them on to man, to mankind, that whoever says La ilaha illallah truthfully from his heart shall enter Al Jannah. This hadith Imam Ahmad reports it, and Sheikh Al Albani said that it's Sahih in his work as Sahihah. Rahimahullah Ta'ala. The fifth condition is submission, Al Inqiyad. And this is and this negates <coughs> disobedience. Allah says in the Quran, Waman Yusli Mujahu ilallahi wa huwa muhsinun faqadistam saka bil urwa til wuska wa ilallahi aqiba tul umur. Allah says, Whoever submits his face to Allah and he has ihsan, he is a muhsin, he is a good doer, then he has grasped firmly al urratu al wuska. The scholar said that here this means La ilaha illallah. So here <coughs> submission is made a condition to be from the people of La ilaha illallah. The sixth condition is Al Muhabba, which is love. And this negates Al Bugd, which is the opposite of it, which is hating. Allah says in the Quran, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَتَّخِذُ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ أَنْدَادًا يُحِبُّونَهُمْ كَحُبِّ اللَّهِ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَشَدُّ حُبًّا لِلَّهِ And Allah says in the Quran that from mankind are those people who take and sit up rivals alongside Allah and they love them as they love Allah. As for those people who believe, then they love Allah more than anything else. So here this means that you love Allah and you, have, and you love the messenger, and you love La ilaha illallah, and you love its people. <clears throat> the seventh condition being Al-Qabul, which is acceptance, and this negates rejection. Allah says in the Quran, إِنَّمَا كَانَ قَوْلَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِذَا دُعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ لِيَحْكُمَ بَيْنَهُمْ أَنْ يَقُولُوا سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ <clears throat> Allah says in the Quran that the the believers <coughs> are those people when they are called to the judgment of Allah and His Messenger, they say we hear and we obey. They accept their judgment. Allah goes on to say, and they are those people who are successful. And Allah also mentions in the Quran in Surah Safat, <coughs> says, فَإِنَّهُمْ يَوْمَ إِذِنْ فِي الْعَذَابِ مُشْتَرِكُونَ That that day, these people, they will... In the, uh, in the adab, in the punishment, they shall, uh, they shall have a punishment which they shall share. And he goes on to say, Inna kathalika naf'alu bil mujrimin. And this is how we treat the criminals. Then he goes on to mention their crime. He says, Innahum, innahum kanu idha qila lahum la ilaha illallah yistakbirun. Their crime is that when it was said to them, believe in la ilaha illallah, they would puff themselves up with pride and they would not accept la ilaha illallah. Allah says in the Quran, in these stories, there is a lesson for the men of understanding. Um, so the, men, the, point, the whole point of mentioning these seven conditions is not that we just memorize them and we parrot them, but rather that we memorize them and we act upon them. As the scholars have mentioned, how many people are there that have memorized these conditions but do not fulfill them? And how many people are there that have not memorized these conditions but they have fulfilled them? So we ask Allah in ending that he teaches us beneficial knowledge and he benefits us with that which he has taught us and he makes us from the people of La ilaha illallah. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala abdihi wa rasuli Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. Now, ikhwani, after that presentation of the shurut or the conditions of the kalimat la ilaha illallah will open up the floor for any questions or any comments that you brothers may have. Barakallahu fikum wa assalamu alaikum. Halindukum shaykh.
So for those who didn't hear, the brother wants to know about the people who are Muslims who were not practicing because they didn't know. They were ignorant. And they were oppressed by people. The ignorant people were oppressed by people. Would those ignorant people be paid back? Would they get their reward for the oppression that they had to deal with? Yom al -Qiyamati? Um, that, that from which I know, it's not a condition. Knowledge is not a condition for you to have your rights. So inshallah they are rewarded and they are, did you get their haq. Because knowledge is not a condition to have your haq. As long as, as long as they're Muslims, they get their haq, inshallah. As long as they believe in Allah and the Messenger, and they meet, the, and, you know, the Muslims, they get their haq, inshallah. So, yeah. uh, to add on to that, it's a pretty clear-cut issue. Muslim, non-Muslim, Allah Azza wa He doesn't love oppression, and He didn't legislate oppression. Subhanahu wa Taala. As many ayat of the Quran has established, وَمَا اللَّهُ بِذَلَّامِنَ الْعَبِيدِ Allah Azza wa Jal is not oppressive to his servants. So if an individual is oppressed by just a small amount, then it's going to be brought forth يوم القيامة. There's an authentic hadith that the Nabi told the people sallallahu alayhi wa sallam اِتَّقُوا دَعْوَةَ الْمَظْلُومِ فَلَيْسَ بَيْنَهَا hijab. Beware of the dua of the person who is oppressed because there is no partition between his dua and between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are two words from other narrations that said, Beware of the dawah of the oppressed, even if he is a fasiq. And another hadith said, Even if he is a kafir. A fasiq or a kafir. If they are oppressed, then there's nothing between them and between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as Allah Azza wa Jal would answer the dua even of a kafir or a fasiq who is oppressed. So no one is going to be oppressed. Yomul Qiyamah. Authentic hadith. The Nabi said, Everybody who's sitting here right now, you have a place in Jannah and you have a place in the Nar. Everybody. So everyone from Beni Adam he has a place in the Jannah, he has a place in the Nar. When Munkar and Nakir comes to the individual and he sits him up, if he's from the people of the Nar, he'll be told, look over there to your right. He'll see his place that was for him in the Jannah. But they say, but you didn't do right. You didn't do right. So look to your left. That's your place in the hellfire. And then he'll make a dua. Allahumma la tuqim sa'a. Don't establish the hour. He doesn't want to see Allah. So Allah doesn't want to see him. And the believer as well will come. And Munkar and Nakir will set him up. And say look to your left. He'll look to his left. He'll see his place in the hellfire. They said that would have been your place. That would have been your place. But Allah is qadr. Allah wrote for you khay. Look to your right. That's your praise in the jannah. He'll make the dua, Allahumma aqimu sa'a. Oh Allah, establish the hour. Establish the hour. So he loves to see Allah, meet Allah. Allah loves to meet him. Those empty spaces for the people who will not be in Jannah, they're going to be occupied by believers who were oppressed by those individuals. They'll get their chairs and wherever they're going to be. And those empty places in the hellfire for the people who will be in the Jannah, then it Vali mean the kuffar people, they're going to occupy them places because Allah promised La Amla Anna is going to fill up the Jahannam with the jinn and the ins ajma'in. And Allah Rabbi wa Rabbukum is A'la and A'la. Any more questions, Ikhwani? Bilal, Bilal. 
تري تفضل Yes. That hadith is not authentic. The great scholar of the hadith, Al Imam Abdurrahman ibn al Jawzi Abu Faraj, he brought that hadith in his book, Kitab al Mawdu'at, as being a hadith that is fabricated. But there is a part of the hadith that is true. That is true. From the khasais of the prophets and the messengers, from their special characteristics. Is that they do not die hatta yukhayyirahum Allah. They are not, they don't die until Allah sends to them an angel to ask them, you want to die or not? And it's not up to them to die or not. And all of them reply that, okay, like the Prophet bal rafiq al a'la. In a rafiq al a'la. He said that when Jibril came to him, and he gave him this choice. You want to die? You want to live? He said, I want to go and meet the uh, fraternity on high, the fraternity on high. So that aspect of the hadith is authentic, but as such, the hadith is fabricated. How do we understand it? Yeah. So our brother Bilal wants to know what is the understanding of the hadith where a man will be brought forth, brought forth Yom Al-Qiyama and he'll have scrolls laid out before him, 99 scrolls of all evil deeds. And he'll have a card or a bataqa and on that card is La ilaha Allah, and his 99 books of bad deeds will be put in the scale and the bataka will be put in the scale and la ilaha illallah will outweigh it how do we understand that this is part of no So, Akhuna Yusuf, inshallah. Concerning this hadith, Ikhwani, very quickly, very, very quickly, is from the hadith that go to show the importance of La ilaha illallah. As Allah Ta'ala mentioned in the Quran, in Allah, La yaghfirun yushraka bihi. Allah does not forgive that you make shirk with him, but he'll forgive any and everything other than that. This hadith is authentic. And Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah mentioned about the hadith, as Yusuf mentioned, that according to the statement of the Salaf, like Imam al-Hasan al-Basri, as he mentioned, they used to say that La ilaha illallah is the miftah of al Jannah, but every key it has some teeth to it. So the person has to come with conditions of La ilaha illallah. So if they come with those conditions, then La ilaha illallah is going to be a kafara for what they did. If Allah Ta'ala chooses, they'll go to the hellfire, but eventually they're going to come out. And if He chooses, 
to forgive them, they won't even go to the hellfire. Man qala la ilaha illallah nafa'atu yawmi min dahrihi. Anyone who says la ilaha illallah is going to benefit him sooner or later. So the meaning of the hadith is the individual who he had Islam, but he made mistakes. He had Islam, but he made mistakes, but he didn't make a shit with Allah Azza wa Jal. His la ilaha illallah, that pataq will be a kafara for him. Yawm al qiyam, an expiation for his sins. Another very important aspect of the hadith is that the hadith goes to show, it goes to show al iman with the mizan as well. Al iman with the mizan or in the mizan from the asul of the dawah of Ahl al hadith, Ahl al athar, so that we believe that there is a mizan where the deeds of the people will be placed on good deeds and bad deeds. And those scholars who took the position and the opinion that an individual who abandons the salat out of being lazy, out of being negligent, which is an act of kufr, and it's a kabir from the kabair, but it doesn't take them outside of the fold of Islam and the qawl rajih they took this hadith as an example and the delil and the proof that the person who didn't pray, he didn't pray, but he was lazy, he still is going to go to Al-Jannah and he doesn't go outside of the fold of Al-Islam. And Allah Ta'ala, Rabbi wa Rabbukum is A'la and A'lam. Somebody had his hand up next to Bilal. Akhi, Aniq. Taking what? Petitions. Uh, taking part in petitions, getting involved so they don't ban the niqab and things like that. What is the ruling concerning these issues? Concerning the issues of petitions, there are a number of fatawa of the sheikh and the imam, a sheikh ibn Uthaymeen, where these issues were presented to him that we live in Western societies where we have to get involved in the political sphere and arena in order to get aspects of our religion practice or things that go against our religion to be prevented. What is the permissibility of that? The Sheikh in his fatawa was consistent in saying that this is something permissible with conditions something that's permissible with conditions that we don't compromise any aspects of the religion of al islam that the thing that we're trying to actually get implemented or prevented it is really from the dean or against the dean and it can't be like some nonsense someone may say that's simple basic and fundamental but it's not these days there is a petition or a thing where they're going to have hijab day Hijab day, where everyone in the dunya is encouraged to wear hijab. And the hijab that they're talking about is the hijab, a scarf on the head. Muslim, non-Muslim, everybody, so that everybody can see what Muslim women have to go through. This has no asl in the deen. La yandaraj tahta ay aslam in asul deen. Has nothing to do with the religion of al-Islam. So the sheikh, from his adilla that he brought, were those statements of the Qur'an like the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa ta'awanu al-birri wa taqwa wa la ta'awanu al-ithmi wa al-udwan and it's easy to find that particular uh, type of uh, fatwa from him if you go to his fatwa and Allah knows best Akhi Dawood Is it better for the person who is being oppressed to be patient or is it better for the person to seek his haq? Allah mentioned in the Quran, بَلَ الْإِنسَانُ عَلَى نَفْسِهِ بَصِيرًا وَلُوْ أَلْقَى مَعَاذِيرًا The person knows his situation better than everybody else. 
He knows his situation better than everybody else. So he's the one who's going to determine that. Should he be patient? Should he not be patient? But the Nabi did tell the people in the times of the fitna, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he told a man, when the fitna happens, take your sword and break it off on the mountain of Uhud and be the son of Adam that was killed and don't be the son of Adam who did the killing. So that man had a right to protect himself. He had a right to protect himself. But the Nabi advised him, be the son of Adam who was killed and don't be the son of Adam who did the killing. Those scholars said, but that's in the time of Al-Fitna, when there's fitna going on and stuff like that. And fitna suggests you don't know up from down, sunnah from batil, haq from whatever, you don't know. So in that time, don't engage, don't say nothing, don't, in, don't do anything. But if someone is outright oppressing you, that oppression can have an impact on the quality of your life and your children's lives and people who are close to you, you have every right to get your haq from them. So the individual, he knows his case better than everybody else. With that, Ikhwani, we're going to stop right here, inshallah, Azujal. I just want to mention to all of you brothers that our brother Yusuf, he came back from Al Medina and he's with us in this vacation time for him. Uh, and he came today in order to participate in the Dawa. You young brothers, we hope that you will all continue to see Allah Azzawajal as being able to do any and everything. Any and everything. You have the opportunity to also go to Al Medina or Mecca or any other of those institutions over there in the Arab lands or other than that. But in the meantime, in between time, we all have a religious responsibility, inshallah, azawajal, to continue to be students of knowledge to the best of our ability and what our situation allows us here. So we ask Allah, azawajal, by his ism al-a'zam to give tawfiq to Brother Yusuf and to you and to us as well and to accept, inshallah, azawajal, from all of us our efforts. Hadha wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته